My Time at Sandrock is a good game, like, really good. It's a sandbox RPG set in a post-apocalyptic world where players take the role of a builder tasked with rebuilding the town of Sandrock. And in this video, I'm gonna cover everything you need to know about gameplay mechanics, crafting, building, combat, farming, relationships, and so much more. So let's get started. And stick around to the end. I've got some great tips and tricks as well. 330 years after something called the Calamity, we find ourselves taking a job as the builder for a town called Sandrock. This planet was once filled with a beautiful, thriving civilization. They had plenty of space stations, robots with artificial intelligence, beautiful skyscrapers, and a ton more. But the Calamity destroyed all of that. And the human race, now at a fraction of the size that they used to be, has been rebuilding since. We find ourselves being trained into Sandrock, tasked as the builder who's going to take this small desert town and create a beautiful, thriving city. And while at this point the game is still in early access, there's a massive quest line, including a large main quest series and dozens of side quests. You're also going to be taking commissions as the builder to help out all of your friends throughout the town. Now, I'm not going to ruin the story for you, but it is very good. So let's move on to game mechanics. When you first load up and you see your character sitting there, you've got a main interface with all kinds of information. Some of the most important things to know are the health and stamina bars, which are here and here. You've got your hot bar down here, which has all of the items that you can use in the world. You've got a larger inventory, but the things that you can interact with in the world are found on your hotbar. Your level is over here. Any buffs, status effects, any changes to your character are going to be found here. Over here, you've got the map and the time of the day, week, and season. And up here, you've got some quests. After opening up your menu, you're going to see a lot of tabs on this screen that has pretty much all of the detailed information you're going to need for the rest of the game. So let's go through from left to right. Your first tab is going to be your character. This has your character rank and XP to their next rank, as well as your workshop rank and the XP to that's next rank. Status effects are down here. We talked about those earlier. They're the icons in the bottom left-hand corner of your main screen. And this just gives you more information about what they are and what effects they have. Here you're going to find your gear. This is all of the items that you have equipped on your character, like their shirt, for instance. And all of that gear has different stats to it. You can see those stats by scrolling over the gear and just kind of viewing what they are. If you look over here, you're going to find your current stats for your character, and that's what all of the gear pieces add up to give you in total. Moving on to the next tab, you've got your inventory. Up here is the toolbar. If you drag things from your main inventory window here into your toolbar, you'll then be able to use them when you're interacting out in the world. Detailed look at any item in your inventory on this screen. You can also buy more inventory space if you're frequently running out. The cost of these slots increases as you own more. For instance, each slot in the first row costs 10 coins, but by the time you get down to the fourth or fifth row, you're going to be paying 150 or 300 coins for a single slot. The next tab you're going to see is the map, and this continues to expand as you explore and discover more of the world around you. There's a lot more to Sandrock than you see at the start of the game. One of my favorite icons here is this little icon. This is where you go to to travel throughout the map. It kind of works like a taxi stop. So for instance, if I were to travel here, I could then fast travel to any of the other icons on the map. It's very helpful and something that I didn't know when I started. The next tab is the missions tab, and it gives you a basic rundown of everything you need to do as well as the rewards that you'll get for completing those tasks. One of the most important things that you can find on this page is the time left indicator for each quest, because every commission, as well as some other quests, are time limited. You may only have two days, three days, a week to complete it, and this time ticks down as you get closer to your time frame. So just keep an eye on these to make sure you are prioritizing whichever quests are about to expire. The next tab is the handbook, and this has almost all of the information you're going to need throughout my time at Sandrock. It has all of the recipes for everything you can craft at the assembly table, but you can also scroll over one of those items and click the magnifying glass to see the recipes of all that item can make, so it's really helpful and really well laid out. The next tab is the social tab, and we're going to go over relationships later on in the video, so make sure you stick around for that. But this tab gives you everything you need to know, including successful gifts that you've already given them, essentially your gift preferences that you know about, as well as some relationship status rewards, because there's some really good ones later on. Next up, you'll find the calendar. This has some basic holiday info, and you can add reminders and different birthdays once you start figuring those out. Next, you'll find your perk tree. There's four different specialties, and you're going to get XP for each specific specialty when you're doing an action related to that tree. For instance, 
if you're fighting monsters, you're going to get experience to use for the combat tree. Whereas if you're interacting or giving gifts to other people, you'll get experience for the relationships tab. The next tab over is your album, and that just lets you relive some of the highlights from earlier in the game. Next tab is the encyclopedia, and it has basic knowledge about all the in-game items, wildlife, and area. Definitely worth giving it a check out so that you know kind of what's there. And then over here you've got your system, and that's how you save the game. So if you've played my time at Porsche, it's important to know that this is how you save. Sleeping does auto-save, but you can save at any point throughout the game. So that's a really nice change and something that I applaud the developers for adding. Now let's talk about gameplay mechanics. This is going to be a shorter chapter because I'm going to go in depth in the later chapters, but one thing to keep in mind is that your character has both stamina and health bars. Health bars obviously get lowered when you take health damage, and you will die in this game, so that means you've got to revert to the last save, whether it be an auto save or a physical save. And stamina is useful to use any tool you've got in your inventory, whether it be your sword and shield, your daggers, or your pickaxe. You'll find that you run low on this one very frequently. It can be replenished by eating food or by sleeping. It can also be replenished by sitting on something comfortable, but that's really pretty slow and generally considered a waste of time. Now let's move on to crafting and building. In my time at Sandrock, you're going to need to gather resources like wood, stone, and iron to craft items and build structures. You can chop trees with your axe, mine rocks with your pickaxe, and scavenge scrap metal from old machinery. Once you have the necessary resources, you can use different machines to make new items like tools, furniture, and decorations. You can also build structures like houses, barns, and workshops, which can all be customized with different materials and colors. There's lots of resources scattered throughout the different parts of the map, so let's kind of go over where to find them in the beginning. Water is used in every machine, and it keeps the machines cool in that really hot desert sun. At the beginning of the game, you're going to be able to buy it from Waterworld, but you can also craft it from dew at the work table, and dew can be found in some plants, but there's also a dew collector that you'll unlock later on in the game. Wood can be found from recycling wood scrap. You can gather small amounts from some plants in the ball cacti. They can be dropped by thorny jumpers over here, or they can also be purchased at Waterworld. Wood is really scarce early on in the game, so I recommend upgrading to the second tier of axe. That way you can chop down these dead trees over here and you'll have plenty of wood. Stone can be obtained by recycling stone scrap, mining gravel or other rocks, dropped by rocket roosters, and bought at Euphala Salvage here. Copper and bronze bars are another very important material. You can process copper bars from copper ore or bronze from copper and tin ores. Both of these ores are found underneath the abandoned ruins at Euphala Salvage. Copper can be found between floors 1 and 11, and tin through floors 5 and 11. Both of these ores can also be purchased at the Ufala Salvage store. And if you're just looking for copper bars, you can also get them from copper scrap. They're dropped by gigglers, robots, and wild yakmo, actually. And then you can also purchase the bars themselves at hammer time. Rubber scrap can also be one of the harder materials to come by. It can be found kind of southwest of your house, and then in and near the salvage yard. That's the only way I know of to get rubber, but if you know of some additional way, leave it in the comments down below. So now that you've got the resources, let's talk about manufacturing them into something useful. When I boil it down in my head, I kind of find that there's three different types of machines in this game. There's your assembly station, and that's what allows you to build the manufacturing machines, as well as some really large items, like the mechanical lifts that you use to get into Ufella Salvage. Then you've got the work table, and this is where you would kind of just assemble all of the parts to create a final object that's smaller than what you would need for the assembly station. Something like a small chair or stone daggers would be made on the work table. And the third category are processing machines. These take raw resources and refine them into something you can use either at your work table or at the assembly station. These processing machines require both fuel and water. When you're in the beginning of the game, definitely use dregs as your first line of fuel, then power stones, and then wood. And as far as water goes, unless you have that dew collector, you're going to just need to suck it up and buy it from Waterworld. Most of these machines can be upgraded through various tiers. In order to upgrade the machines, you're going to have to research the higher tiered crafting stations at the research center, which is over here. You can talk to Chi, and he'll research those hey higher level techs. To do this, you're going to need research discs, which can be found in any of the ruins scattered throughout Sandrock. At the beginning of the game, you're only going to have access to the abandoned ruins, but there's a plethora of them there. One of the first things I'd recommend looking into would be the Duke Collector. 
And if there's something else you're looking to upgrade that you can't find here, you could wander over to the construction junction. They'll upgrade some of your really large buildings and the assembly station as well. So for instance, if you wanted to start keeping chickens, you could buy the barn here. You can increase the size of your yard, you can upgrade the assembly station, and buy a bigger house. All that can be done over at the construction junction, which is found right here. Now let's move on to combat. If you've played My Time at Porsche, the combat system has been updated and really flows a lot better. It's a lot more flashy and fun to engage with. There's four different melee weapons and two different ranged weapons that create a variety of attack styles, speeds, and movements. And a lot of the animals drop helpful items. For example, Wild Jackmel, for whatever reason, drop copper bars. The hostile dungeons drop some advanced crafting materials like engines. And since 99% of what you're going to be doing during combat is only done with a single button, which makes this the perfect game to let your Super Smash Bros. button mashing inner child fly. Next, I'd like to move on to farming, ranching, and fishing. None of these three activities are strictly speaking necessary to get through the game as long as you do it once or twice to kind of progress through the main storyline. That's enough, but there are a lot of helpful things that can come with it. Sand fishing is going to be the first thing you unlock. Basically, I guess there's some fish that swim in the sand here because why not? And to catch those fish, you're just going to need to throw some bait out. And then after you throw some bait out, eventually a fish will come and kind of wander around the sandy area. You're just going to throw your net a little bit in front of it in order to catch the fish. You'll need to upgrade your sand fishing net eventually, and this will allow you to catch a wider variety and larger fish. These fish are often useful for commissions on the second page of the commission board, but you can also cook them and use them to heal your health and stamina later on. The next thing you're going to unlock is ranching, which is available fairly early and can make a decent amount of money. You're going to need to buy a building at the construction junction, whether that's a coop, a barn, stable, depending on which animal you need, and then you're going to have to buy the animal from the farm. Then once you do that, as long as you tend to them every morning, which really doesn't take that long, you can sell their byproducts and make a fair amount of cash from that. And then you've got farming, which as you can imagine, it's not easy in the desert. So that's going to be unlocked really late in the game. Eventually though, it will be helpful. You can make a lot of money doing it. Uh, you can also grow trees to get wood from it. There's a lot of different things you can do. But in order to farm, you're going to need this toolkit. You can open it up from your hotbar and then it's going to replace your entire UI. Whenever you plant a new crop, you're going to have to use straw to create these new straw barriers to help protect those crops. And the first time you plant a crop, you'll see the ground converts into this soil with a level. You can level up the ground by planting more crops in it over time, and this will reward you with a bigger harvest when it's grown up. This agriculture stuff really isn't a super important part of the game. It's really more focused on the building and, and really turning this town into what it can be. It does pop its head up from time to time, so I just thought I'd address it. Now we've covered just about everything you need to know, but there are a couple more topics I wanted to cover, and I think that they're really helpful. And those are increasing your relationships and time management throughout the day, which are both really important topics and helped me transform my gameplay into something really a lot better. So let's start with relationships. All those villagers that are wandering around and have different personalities, well they're not just there for show. Having great relationships with all the unique characters in the village it comes with a lot of benefits, like free gifts, more stamina, discounts at stores, all kinds of things. In order to level up your relationships, you're going to have a few options. You can chat with a character once a day for one relationship point, or two if you've unlocked the relationship perk for it. You can play critters, which is essentially rock, paper, scissors. Losing a match gives you one relationship point, a draw gives you three, and a win gives you five. This is kind of time consuming though. Really the best way to level up your relationship with other characters is to be giving them their liked and loved gifts. This is a common theme throughout a lot of these more leaned back video games that have relationships, but Gifts are going to be the best way to increase your relationship with somebody. Every unique character has their own likes and dislikes. For instance, Mayan or Mian, I don't know how you say her name. She likes bronze plates. Fang, not so much. In order to know what to get these characters, I would recommend checking out the article on the wiki. It's really well laid out, and I'm going to link that below. But besides these free gifts, stamina, and discounts, they've also implemented marriage into this game, which is really helpful. When you finally get a spouse, you'll find out that they help a lot around the workshop, and can do things like collecting goods from the machines, adding fuel and water to the machines, and farming your land. Much like the villagers' different likes and dislikes, though, some characters have limitations on what they will help you with. 
In addition to what they help you with, there's also a certain number of different tasks that they can perform. These are measured with something called action points. And you don't need to be at the max relationship level to marry a character, so as you continue to raise their relationship, you'll get more action points as you continue. For example, Amira starts with 6 action points, but ends with 8. And Mian starts with 10 and can go all the way up to 16, whereas Pablo, the most he can get is 3. If you're only worried about getting the most AP points out of a marriage and you don't care about the story or the characters' personalities at all, Arvio, Venti, Mian, and Unser can do the most, with a max action points between 16 and 20. And different tasks around the workshop require a different amount of AP. Some as low as 1, and others cost as much as 3 action points. That got a little bit away from me, and was a little bit technical, but just know that, you know, relationships are helpful. Hang in there, because we only have one more topic to cover, and that's time. Time is by far the most valuable resource in my time at Sandrock, and it runs out way too quickly every day, kind of like in real life. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about how I optimize my day and my time at Sandrock. And this means limiting the amount of time moving from place to place and waiting for resources to finish at my workshop and increasing the amount of time actually being productive. First thing I do is check the mail, because you might get a new recipe or who knows what you're going to get at present, who knows. So check your mail first thing. Then, when you're later on in the game, you're going to be doing your farming. This is the point in time where I'll head to the commission board and see if there's any commissions that I can take. Then I'll head back to the workshop and get my machines processing for the day. And I do this because there's a little bonus when you complete the commission in the same day that you got it. Next, I'm going to head out and collect more raw resources I need for this particular commission. And if I have all of the resources I need, then I'm going to go out and get more of the resource that I use to create this commission. That way I always have a little bit of stock of the most important things. Again, increasing my chance of being able to complete the commission in the same day. And I hope you're seeing a theme here. I'll repeat this until I get the commission done, or if it's a really lengthy commission, until all of my machines are full and I'm pretty much out of stamina. But once the commission's complete and you're out of stamina, there's really nothing else you can do at the workshop. So this is when we head into town, we start to turn in those commissions and do all those social interactions, accepting quests along the way. This is the time when you would give that bronze plate to me. Finally, you're going to head back to your workshop, collect all of the completed resources within the machines, and refill any machines that need to be refilled, and you can go ahead and sleep and get ready for the next day. Now, obviously not every day is going to go like this, because there's lots of variable factors that can change the way you play. And truthfully, every day shouldn't go the same. This is a sandbox game. But if you're in a funk, you're having trouble keeping up on your resource collection, or you can't get done everything you want to in a day, maybe try using this kind of guideline for your next few days in Sandrock. And now for a few bonus tips. Items and crafting stations can be found in the encyclopedia. We touched on this earlier, but if you're really struggling to figure out where something is made, how it's made, or I don't know, something along those lines, check out your encyclopedia and go into the crafting stations tab. Then you'll be able to toggle over the different crafting stations and see what products they can make. This can be really helpful for a commission that requires you to, I don't know, get a bronze greatsword for pen. Uh, it's tricky because it's not made at the work table, so you kind of have to go in and figure out which workstation it's made at, but the encyclopedia can help with that. Another great tip is that if you're running out of stamina or health, you can add decorations to your house. One of the really unique aspects of the My Time series is that decorations aren't purely aesthetic. They also provide a lot of function in your day-to-day -day routines in Sandrock. They provide lots of bonuses, like more stamina or more health. So if you find yourself running out of stamina frequently, add some decorations. If you can't find any you can really easily make, you can consider checking out Amira's pottery shop in town. She sells decorations that can increase the amount of stamina and health you have at a baseline. And if you find that you're buying decorations and placing them down in your house and your health and stamina aren't going up the next day, it could be because you need to upgrade your house. There's only so much you can increase your health and stamina by. And by increasing the level of your house, you're going to increase how much stamina and health you can add to your character through the use of decorations. That's about it for this guide to my time at Sandrock. I hope you're excited to dive into the game and start building and exploring. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.